to episode 4 of Obsolete, the show where old technology goes to live. I'm Phantom Command, and uh, today we have a pretty interesting episode for you guys. Uh, this is the first episode to feature guest segments, and we have a guest segment from Shin Marayu, and another guest segment from Pat. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go into a Shin Marayu segment. Hi there, this is Shin Marayu for, uh, well, Obsolete, I guess in this case. I'm doing a little bit of a guest segment here. Uh, if you have any questions about the following guest segment, hit me up on uh, Twitter at ShinMariu. Uh, this segment is going to be a small lesson on um, scrap stereo systems, uh, buying a stereo system from a thrift store, and how to get the most of it from your money when you're buying a uh, full-on stereo system uh, by the component. So first off, a little tour of what I have currently as my stereo system and a few of the downfalls of that. This is my personal stereo system. This stereo system is a MCS stereo system. Uh, I'd give you the exact model number, but I don't really feel like yanking this giant beast away from the wall. So uh, what this stereo system is, is it's basically an all-in-one component system uh, with a built-in power supply, uh, which means you can't replace any of the single parts because it's all built into, uh, well, something that weighs about as much as an old 1970s Buick. So, uh, one of the downfalls of this system is MCS was a somewhat of an off-brand of an off-brand, which was then sold by J.C. Penney's and Sears, as the greatest thing money can buy when it comes to a stereo system to people who didn't know better. Uh, these systems were basically built in China using parts uh, from lesser known uh, electronics manufacturer companies. Uh, the ones that I know of are Panasonic and Tech Technics um, and Matsuhita. Uh, so basically uh, these were, well, they were decent electronics companies that then had their parts assembled in questionable Chinese factories. That way, uh, J.C. Penney's and Sears could sell these systems for quite a low price to the consumer. Now, if you think about it, this is the age of the stereo. This is when people really wanted to go out and buy a great big stereo system for their living room and um, have parties and things like that with the big booming speakers and this was the age of the audiophile as they say. Um, this is back when you could probably spend as much on your stereo system as you did on your car uh, depending on what kind of components you put into it. So for JC Penney's and Sears to be, off be able to offer this all-in-one system that usually included speakers and a faux wood grain uh, cabinet with glass doors and it looked real fancy. Uh, for them to be able to offer this at a low price was definitely a huge advantage for JC Penney's and Sears. This system in my case includes a receiver, a AM FM stereo system, a twin deck tape uh, recorder and player, uh, stereo equalizer with separate controls for each speaker set as well as a turntable so this was definitely a um, enticing option for the consumer back in the 1980s so with that uh, this next little segment is actually going to be showing what's uh, on the bottom of my stereo component rack uh, which is my CD changer okay my CD changer my CD changer is a five disc Sony CD changer uh, paid about eight or nine dollars for this at a thrift store. Uh, not exactly positive on the model number, but I do know that this was created sometime in the 1990s. Uh, it has excellent sound quality. Uh, it's uh, piped out via a RCA stereo uh, cable, your typical RCA stereo component cables. So these allow you to easily hook them up to um, any kind of relatively modern uh, stereo mixer and get your sound out through your speakers. Um, most of the time that these came with remotes, mine did not because of course I bought it at a thrift store. So one of the little hazards of buying uh, components at a thrift store is you might not always get all the parts that came with it when it was new. But it's excellent component 
And uh, with that, let's get into some of the other components that you can purchase and build up yourself a scrap stereo system. So, what do you look for when you're buying a scrapped out stereo system? Uh, first of all, you're going to want components from the 1980s and the 1990s. And you're going to want to buy these components on either eBay or at thrift stores. I'd recommend thrift stores. You're going to get a much better price. Uh, for my 5-disc CD changer, I actually only paid a small total of about $9. Uh, for the entire uh, MCS shelf system, including the great speakers and all that kind of stuff, I spent $40. So in total, I only have $50 invested into my current stereo system, which actually included the shelving and everything else as well. Now, brands you're going to want to look for. First of all, the biggest brand you want to look for is by a, uh, it's a Japanese company that was originally owned by Philips and was a pioneer in the compact disc technology. Uh, the company is called Marantz. Uh, they built some insanely cool CD players, but then went on to build ridiculously high-end audio components. Um, a lot of people will swear by the... Uh, tube-based Marantz receivers and tube-based radios by Marantz. I personally am not a big fan of tubes these days because they're kind of a pain to replace, but that still being said, a new or old Marantz receiver will not do you wrong. These things are absolutely amazing. They are built like brick poop houses. Uh, any audiophile will tell you that these things are absolutely amazing. The other companies you want to look out for when you're buying components are Sony. Sony has been a uh, long-known component manufacturer for stereos and electronic equipment. Uh, they build high-quality products that normally last uh, quite a long time and go the distance. You want to look for um, Pioneer. Pioneer has been known to make some really good audio equipment as well. Now, Sony and uh, Pioneer are both consumer-based companies, but that doesn't mean that they make bad product. Some of the companies you want to avoid, once again, you're probably going to want to avoid MCS. Um, I was not pleased with what I purchased uh, in the MCS brand. Uh, a lot of kind of, they cut a lot of corners to save money. And when it came down to it, uh, they were selling these things at JCPenney's back in the day when a stereo system could cost you almost as much as your car. So, and these things were budget systems, so they dropped um, a lot of features, they dropped a lot of quality control to get these things made and into people's homes, and back then you really didn't have the information to tell you, hey, you know what, these things aren't that great. Um, when it comes to uh, turntables, uh, I cannot remember the dang company off the top of my head. Um, te it's not Tektronics, but anyway, uh, there's a company that makes really good turntables that are not expensive. Um, Audio Technica. There we go. So, um, hit up, like, you can hit up Amazon and uh, get you an Audio Technica uh, turntable, and it will last you pretty much forever, because, I mean, not a lot of people are actually going to use their turntable but it's definitely a good brand to own. They're not that super expensive that you get with some of the more uh, boutique uh, turntables. And a lot of the times, uh, Audio Technica is a brand that a lot of DJs use when it comes to um, record scratching. So these things are pretty uh, high-end uh, turntables. Uh, when you get a turntable, make sure you get a direct drive turntable. Uh, the belt drive turntables uh, can be a little bit of a hassle when it comes to maintenance, and uh, the direct drives um, normally are a little bit quieter, and uh, I don't know, I just like them better. I like direct drive turntables quite a bit. So, those are some of the component uh, manufacturers that you should look for. A little bit about turntables, uh, a little bit about uh, buying scrapped out stereo systems, uh, as I said, hit up your thrift stores, go to the electronics department, and for probably 100 150 bucks, you should be able to build yourself one heck of an old-school stereo system. 
Uh, a lot of the cabling that you will need you can pick up from different places like Radio Shack. Uh, make sure you get yourself some nice speaker cable, uh, some good um, uh, terminal connectors. Uh, a lot of the times for my equipment I would actually replace the terminal connectors with some uh, pin snap connectors uh, or some just straight up plugs because uh, a lot of the old screw type connectors are uh, prone to uh, corrosion and not working very well. So, thanks guys for listening. This is uh, Shin Murayu for Obsolete, doing a little guest segment thing here. Talk to you guys later. If you have any questions, you can hit me up at Shin Murayu on Twitter. I think Shin Murayu did a really good job with that segment. I've actually known him for about what feels like a decade. It's probably actually been five years, and we met through Hack5 and Hack5 IRC. And he's a really good guy. He recently redid his website, and he has an awesome YouTube channel. And um, he used to have his own show called The Random Acts of Anarchy. And it was a video show that lasted uh, one episode based off of his podcast of the same name. And um, that show was actually a big inspiration for me to do this. I mean, you see a bunch of shows where you have a bunch of hosts and lots and lots of production value. But he just had himself, you know, and a camera. And he made it work, and I thought that that was something that could be doable after watching that. And um, right now we're going to go into a bit of a cleanup segment from um, some of the past stuff I've done from other episodes. And um, uh, sometimes I have questions about the stuff that I'm using, and I don't even know what it is. And other people offer up their ideas of what it could be used for. Now, um, in episode two... I said that it might be possible to Redbox in the UK, but I recently got a tip from Metatron, who said that you can't Redbox in the UK, at least you couldn't when he worked there. Um, I believe he said something about the use of VoIP makes Redboxing basically unusable. And um, also, from that episode with the tone dialers, um, I talked about the little jack that somebody added to the tone dialer, and um, TestMad said that it might have been used for like a homemade lineman's handset which is sometimes called a beige box so maybe somebody found a way to hook alligator clips on there and you'd hook it up to the phone line you can dial directly in I'm not entirely sure why that would be a good idea because you couldn't like hear or talk but maybe you could even hook that up to I don't know a microphone speaker something like that and um that was basically the thing that Cheese thought it was he thought that it was so you could hook up an external speaker, you know, maybe have the dialer in your pocket, the speaker in your hand, something like that. Now from episode 3, when I had the Betamax player, and there was all the weird kind of knobs on the front, um, I actually had three people uh, correct me on what those are for. Um, Moonlit, Ion Farmer, and um, Mr. Intellivision. And they all told me that that was actually for when you're tuning the channels, and you know you're trying to get your presets in there that's what those are for and um, the port on the back of the Betamax player Cheese thought that, that was to hook it up into a linear editing system of some sort though I'm not entirely sure but I thought maybe you could also hook in a wired remote since they didn't have wireless remotes at that time and uh... maybe I don't know so now we're going into my segment my only segment for this episode and it is Laserdisc Lives. I hope you guys like it. So some of you may be old enough to remember Laserdiscs, but for those of you that don't, I have one right here. This is a Laserdisc from Pulp Fiction. You can see a little reflective there. It's two-sided. Now, Laserdiscs originally came out in 1978, but then they were known as a Disco Vision and um, they came out two years after VHS. Um, they were released through a collaboration between Philips and MCA. Though the technology was invented a long time ago in uh, 1958. And then there was a public demonstration in 1972. But uh, back then it used some sort of like transparent disc. I'm not sure how that worked. But um, after Laserdisc came out, that was known as DiscoVision, it got licensed to a bunch of other companies to make basically the same thing, but they called it something different. So there was Reflective Optical Disc, there was Laser Vision, MCA DiscoVision. Uh, Laser Vision is still popular to see on some of these discs. 
And um, then in the mid-1980s, Pioneer bought the majority of uh, Laserdisc, and they started coming out with a whole bunch of players, new stuff going on. And um, Laserdiscs are considered the grandfather of optical discs. CD and DVD are based on Laserdisc technology. Um, as for the tech specs, Laserdisc is 30 centimeters wide or 11.8 inches. So yeah, Laserdiscs were pretty big, but they also came in different sizes. Right here is the EP size, which is about 7.9 inches. And uh, these are mostly used for music videos. This has six Bon Jovi music videos on it. There's uh, an even smaller size, which I think is uh, 4.2 inches, 4.1 inches, something like that. But I don't have any of those. These are actually the EPs. Pretty hard to find. You don't find a lot of those in North America. Um, but then let's let's take some other different formats here. Here's a vinyl record from uh, David Bowie's Aladdin Sane. Just take that up here next to the laser disc. You can see the laser disc is actually a little bit bigger than the vinyl record. So if you don't have a laser disc, but you have a vinyl record, just imagine a vinyl record a little bit larger. But what else do we have? How about you now you have your select division disc and laser disc? I don't know. It's a little bit bigger, but the caddy on this is kind of big. And then if you want to think about just, you know, one movie on a bunch of different formats, you know, we might have Scarface on Laserdisc. You just have a Betamax tape. Then you have VHS, which is even bigger. And then, you know, Scarface DVD set. Now, if you want to think just disc size, you know, you have your Scarface DVD, then, you know, look at your Scarface laser disc. That's a huge difference right there. They are two-sided aluminum discs, and they're coated with plastic. They have analog video, which is natively composite, and they also have analog or digital audio, usually Dolby Digital or DTS, and that audio is in CD format. Now, there's three types of laser discs based on rotation speed which can improve quality much like how VHS tapes you can use like SP mode, SLP mode, EP mode. Um, there's three types. There's CAV, constant angular velocity, and that has a runtime of 30 minutes. And then there's CLV, constant linear velocity, which is 60 minutes, and this offered a whole bunch more features like slow motion, pause. And there's also CAA, which is constant angular acceleration, which is basically an update to CLV, which reduced crosstalk between the chroma and luma, so it was a better picture. And um, usually some discs have CLV written on them, but they're actually CAA discs. Uh, CAA wasn't really a consumer known thing, everybody just assumed you know you had your standard play and your extended play. Um, as for the audio quality, uh, a lot of the early players had poor analog components, so the audio quality would be really bad. But then the audio also varied from disc to disc, so you might have a really good mastering of the analog audio on one disc, but another disc would be awful. And then they moved up to digital sound to try to prevent this. As for the players themselves, originally they used a helium neon laser tube, which is a gas tube, and they used that up to about 1984. After 1984, they used solid-state laser diodes, though uh, if you get some of the video files, they might tell you that the tube lasers are a lot better because they have better tracking, and they can also read the discs better, especially older discs have a lot better playback using the neon laser tubes. Now, there's two basic types of players. The original ones were top-loading. So you'd open the top of the player and you'd put in your disc. But later they made front-loading players, which operate, you know, like your DVD player would, where a tray pops out of the front. I'm going to be showing that later. Um, some players would only play one side of the disc at a time. These are the early players. So you'd have to get up out of your chair on the couch or whatever, take the disc out, turn it over, and play the other side. And then if you think about it, you might have a movie with 
two, three, four discs, so you kept having to do this over and over and over again. But then they started making double-sided players, so you didn't have to go up, and uh, the player itself would switch between sides of the disc using two lasers, and that would give you like a little 15 second pause in between sides, but it was still better than getting up every half hour or an hour to change it. Um, on top of this, there's also players that have like two disc support, so you can put in two discs into one player, so you don't even have to get up to change discs. And there was also something called a laser stack, which existed for a while, where you'd actually have to remove the top of your laser disc player, and you would mount a device on the player that could hold up to ten discs, and then it could change the discs back and forth automatically. Um, and a little note on PAL discs, they have longer playback, but they don't have as many audio options. So you have a sacrifice there, you might get maybe one or two audio tracks, but you might have a longer disc. Um, going into combination players, in the mid 80s, laser disc players would often be equipped with CD reading capacity. And in the mid 1990s, they had DVD playing capacity. I'm going to be showing both of these. Um, most of them could also play CDVs, which are not to be confused with VCDs. Um, I don't have a lot of info on CDVs, but I'm guessing that they're similar to laser discs in the fact that they have analog video instead of digital video, which VCDs have. Um, there was also some other interesting combination player stuff going on with Muse, also known as High Vision, which was the Japanese's first like attempt at high definition television in the 1980s, and it was actually pretty good. It got um. I think it was 1035i resolution, and if you compare that to like 1080, which we have now, that was a long time ago they had this, and it was pretty good quality. Um, I think this was only released in Japan, and some of the drawbacks were that you needed an additional box to connect it to your TV. And um, I think there was also a problem with motion tracking, so if you had like a lot of motion in the scene, it would become blurry. But these players are often really regarded as like the best players you can get. Um, the comb filter in them, which takes the standard composite video and changes it into chroma and luma for S video, that's apparently like the best comb filter in the world. Like, arguably, that is top of the line comb filtering. And um, these players are also good at reading discs with laser rot. Some of you might be asking, what's laser rot? In the early 1990s, some of you might remember a batch of CDRs made by Philips that had an adhesive that put the disc to the backing, and this adhesive would actually eat into the disc and cause a bunch of problems with it. Now, LaserDisc was the originator of this problem. Um, some of the early discs had a certain backing in them when they did the two sides together, and this adhesive would eventually eat into the aluminum and cause it to oxidize. Now, what does that mean on the disc? Some of them might be actually as good looking as this. You can have a sealed disc, that there doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it at all, and it'll have laser rot. Um, some more extreme cases, the disc actually has like brown specks on it that might look like dirt, but it's actually underneath the plastic layer, so it's in the aluminum. and Basically, if you have that, your disc has some problems. But right here is a picture of some actual video that has laser rot. You can see all the little pixely lines. Those are problems for reading the disc because of the laser rot. Here's a full motion video of the laser rot, and you can see that it degrades the video quality pretty well. Now it is possible to digitally try to remove some of this laser rot if your disc isn't so bad that it won't play. It doesn't look perfect, but at least it's better than having no disc at all. The advantages for laser discs was that they were cheap to make. A uh, VHS tape had like 14 different components, and a laser disc, you know, you could just pump them out. They're also said to last a lifetime if you keep them in good condition. Uh, a VHS tape will wear out after a certain number of plays, but a laser disc can basically be played forever. Uh, the resolution is also a lot better. It's uh, 425 lines versus a VHS tape which has 240. So that's almost double the resolution of a VHS tape. And they came out about the same time. 
There was also a lot of special editions with Laserdiscs, so you could have bonus features, trailers, different audio tracks, commentary tracks, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't normally see in tape. There was a jump to frame option, which it is not even in some DVD players where you just input a frame number and you're there, you don't have to do any fast forwarding or anything. There are some disadvantages to Laserdiscs. Uh, they are very large when compared to other formats. You can't record to them. They have limited playback. They're heavy and cumbersome. The players themselves are pretty heavy too. Now you might ask, why would you use a Laserdisc today? Uh, some museums actually use them for looking at pages of newspaper back when they began. Laserdiscs were pretty popular as compared to VHS tapes. You might have like a store demo unit Laserdisc that displays store information over and over and over again. Uh, they're also used a lot for video games, such as Dragon's Lair. So you have like animation going on in your video game, which was pretty big at the time when these came out. I mean, like, think about games in the 1980s. They weren't that advanced. And you have this, which has basically full video for a game, which is pretty good. And um, a lot of you might probably recognize Laserdisc from school. Like, elementary school, middle school, high school. Usually every science classroom has a Laserdisc player to play some old science video. And you might only ever use it, like, once in your four years in high school. But it's always there. And um, a lot of these laser discs are actually collectible nowadays because they contain director's cuts, uh, a whole bunch of extras that never made it to DVD, and even some of the commentary tracks are never released on DVD. So there's a lot of stuff out here that collectors really like to find and try to convert over the digital because you can't find it anywhere else. And oftentimes you might have a version of a movie available on Laserdisc that you can't get on DVD, like a director's cut or something, and otherwise it's just pretty impossible to find. So now I thought it would be a good idea to go over my Laserdisc collection, which is pretty big, but it's pretty interesting as well. So right here we have Bon Jovi's Breakout, which is a music video Laserdisc. Um, as you can see by the size, it's a lot smaller than most Laserdiscs, it's like an EP size here. And uh, if you look on the back, you have your laser vision mark right here. I said earlier that they were all manufactured with different names, the laser disc technology. But if they had that mark on them, they could be used on any player that also has that mark. So even though the names might be different, you still maintain knowing what's compatible or not. And here's Pulp Fiction. I'm just going to do try to do a run through of each. Have Blade Runner. Uh, Blade Runner is an interesting one because you could not find the original theatrical cut for a long, long time until they finally released it in that Blade Runner box set. So people who wanted Blade Runner the original cut, they couldn't get it, you know, on DVD. So they had VHS or Laserdisc, and because Laserdisc is higher quality, those things became very rare. Now this starts a uh, concert video. Concert videos are very popular on Laserdisc as well as just like music video discs. Pretty good format for getting it out there. And with the digital audio, you know, it's it's perfect for any big fan. Here, just a collector's edition of Evil Dead 2. Another Kiss video here. Not much to look at with that one. Nirvana. Have a Devo music video disc here. Critters. Not quite sure much about this one. Monty Python's Flying Circus. Shine. Not sure about that one, but there's a price tag on here that it was originally forty dollars so thinking about that price tag for these these are pretty expensive at the time and that's just that's a criterion collection disc which probably means it costs a little bit more but if you think about some of the like the huge special edition sets which I'm going to be showing you soon those can probably be really pricey now here's spawn 2 Here we have the first spawn. 
Luke. This one actually opens up. Got some cool illustrations here. All of this is like, it pops out, you can feel it here. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And Alfred Hitchcock Presents. I think this says uh, four episodes from the TV show. This one is Dead Man Walking. And here we have Phantasm. It's your big infold here. The Crossing Guard. Species, the Deluxe Letterbox Edition. Night of the Hunter. Here we have Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Letterbox Edition. This one looks pretty cool. And here's Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, in the Special Collector's Edition. Got some cool stuff on the inside here. Here is True Romance. We have Blowout. Box of Moonlight. The Apostle, this one sealed, looks like someone got it for 15 bucks on clearance. LA Confidential. Rob Roy. Here's a Sonic Youth disc, Rod Stewart disc, it's from his tour. Uh, here's an, uh, another Kiss disc, there's a lot of these. Look, more Kiss, Kiss Confidential, Kiss My A Star Star. California. This is unrated. You didn't really see a lot of unrated movies on VHS. Here's Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. As you can see down here, it's in 3D. And if I open it up, yes, here you are. Original 3D glasses that came with it, which are pretty cool. Shove those back down in there. Steven Spielberg. Orca, the killer whale. Now this one, which is probably my favorite, which is Al Thomas in the world of martial arts. It's a martial arts instructional laser disc. It actually has an introduction by Chuck Norris. And uh, the VHS tapes for this go for maybe seventy to eighty dollars. And you know, it comes with you know all your your moves and stuff. So you know what the hell you're doing. So that's probably, I'd say, the rarest thing that I have in this collection. Found that at Goodwill in the record section. They don't really know the difference between records and laser discs unless you check them. So here's Airplane. And we have a sealed copy of Airport. Creep Show, Night of the Living Dead, 
You can see this one says Landmark Laser Vision. This one uses the Laser Vision name. Here's Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, based on the TV show. And this one's interesting. This is the work in progress version of Beauty and the Beast, as it was shown at the 1991 New York Film Festival. Um, this was pretty hard to find for a while, but I think they released it in DVD a little while back. And I mean, just open it up, it's, it's full of all this stuff. This is probably a great thing to own right there. We have the exclusive widescreen director's cut of Scream. And this is really hard to find as well. This is only available on DVD in Region 2. And even then, it's really hard to find. It's the only thing that you can get it on, on rated in Region 1. Going on to some family stuff now. We have Bambi. Uh, some Christmas classics. Sinead O'Connor. Here's a U2 concert from Sydney. Al Pacino Scarface. The Cook, Their Wife, and the Lover. And now we're going to move on to the like special, special editions of Laserdiscs here. Uh, starting out, some TV series have uh, The Twilight Zone, Creative Vision Volume 3. Open it up here. You know, have your booklet with all the information about the episodes. This is a lot like how you get chapters for like DVDs, but this was back in the 80s. It's the precursor to that. You have your, your discs right here, nothing real special. Here's the Creative Vision Volume 2, but this one's sealed, so can't open this one for you. And, uh, here's something interesting. This is the Criterion Collection of 7. Open that up here. You have this book, you got your discs. This one might be the most extensive of them. This is the Jaws Collector's Edition. You have your Jaws book here. And at the bottom of all these discs, take up this piece, you have the novel and you have the soundtrack. So this probably went for a lot of money. This is for completionists. Although I have to say the box that it's kept in this is pretty flimsy. I don't know how this would have held up. Right here is the door special edition with the holographic on the front here. If I take this out, you got your front right here. You can open it up. And you got this book in the center. I mean, stuff's just crazy how much they put in here. Over here we have Nixon by Oliver Stone. This one's not that much of a collector's edition, it's just really big and it's widescreen. We have Natural Born Killers. You open it up, you now you have all these graphics, and what's on the disc, and then even the disc sleeves themselves. I mean, look at these. All right, quality graphic on the back here. These are just going all out. And then the last one. Terminator 2 Special Edition. This is like a leather case. Probably fake leather. We have Arnold. And then each one of the discs. So yep, that's my laser disc collection. So I currently have six laser disc players. I probably paid ten to fifteen dollars each for them. Uh, four of them work perfectly, but two of them have problems, which I may try to work out later. But um, I still have four that work, so you know I'm not in any big hurry.
and I'm just going to show them off one at a time, all the features they may have, and give a little bit of information about some of the stuff along the way. Alright, so right here, we have a Pioneer laser disc player. It's a multiplayer for CDs, CDVs, and laser discs. Uh, this one's also a five disc changer. And you have, you know, your headphone part, a repeat button, all your direct search buttons here on the side. Let's see here. And then, you know, you have your skip, your scan, you have play, pause, open, stop. Uh, you want a random CD, you can go by disc number. I'm guessing that goes right to CD, so you don't have any, like, screen that you're watching or anything. So maybe you can just plug this into, like, your stereo system or something. Moving on to the back. I mean, it's pretty basic. We have two sets for composite out, so you have your audio out, your video out. A uh, VHF adapter here for video and mono audio. And over here, there's a control in and out and a CD deck synchro. So that was an example of one with CD playback capabilities. Uh, this next one right here, I'll show you this. It's a, uh, another Pioneer model and it has a DVD drive. And this one has both side play actually for laser discs. So, as you can see over here on this side, your stop button, your open and close button for DVD or CD, your open and close for laser discs. Now you have your laser disc side buttons here, A and B. Play, pause, and you have reverse and forward, stuff like that. Now, on the back here, this is one of the more higher end models. So you have two video out composite and you have your S video out. Now, a note about S video out with laser disc players, they rely on their own internal comb filter since they're natively composite for taking the video and splitting it up into chroma and luma. Now, some people may argue that the filter in the laser disc player is really good, but a lot of people tend to say that any sort of comb filter used in, like, say, your TV to sort out the chroma and luma would be a lot better than the one that's in a laser disc player because the laser disc player uses older technology. Um, that's up to you. If you're going to do something like that, like go compo composite versus um, S video, that's something you can try out just by going by eye. For me, I don't really think it makes much of a difference. Um, you have your audio out, standard composite, AC3 out, digital audio out, and PCM out, and then you have your control for in and out, and then here's a PCM AC3 digital output. Now, that has a DVD player on it, and uh, we all know that DVD has, most DVDs have copy protection. But um, as for laser discs, there is no copy protection. So you can just copy laser discs left and right without having to worry about anything like that. So right here we have yet another Pioneer model. Um, on your left here it has all the standard buttons, power, and you can turn the display on and off. And then up here you see both side play. And it has direct CD again and A and B as said with both side play. Eject, stop, play, pause. And then there's some interesting options over here. Soft picture, film mode. Not exactly sure what that means exactly. But, you know. And then here's a jog shuffle thing. This might be a slow motion or some type of fast forward rewind that you can change with how fast you do it. And on the back, this is a lot like the last player. You have your control again, your audio out, S video out, composite video out, coax digital out, and optical digital out. This one's probably not as high end as the last one, but this one has a lot of audio options for anybody wanting to hook this up to a home theater system. Now, just as a little bit of an aside from seeing all these players, you might be wondering, well, how do they work? Now I'm going to show you. I have this player plugged into the TV through composite video 
and uh, power it on. See the Pioneer logo coming up on the television. And now it says uh, no disc. So what are we going to do? Let's see. Do we want DVD or CD? No, I think we're going to pass on that. How about a uh, laser disc? Now, here's one of the discs from Pulp Fiction. Now, if you look here on the very bottom, it says, Program material has been recorded only on the other side of this disc. But what happens if we play the side there's no program material on? So let's load it up here. Alright. Laser disc is stopped. It's ready to go. Let's hit play. Spin it up. Program material is recorded only on the other side of this laser video disc. Now you can see on the player, you have a number spinning there in the bottom right hand corner. I'm guessing that's probably what the frame number is or something like that. I'm not entirely sure. But then Alright, I guess we're done with this disc. So let's see here. I'm going to want to stop it. And it spins down. And then uh, let's take our disc back. Now, sometimes when you have these laser discs and you go to a site where you can't play, there's actually a nice little picture of a turtle that's on its back that comes up that says the material is only on the other side of the disc. And uh, that's kind of like a little mascot of a laser disc, the laser disc turtle. And uh, a lot of people really like that. It's kind of like an Easter egg about laser discs that not many people know of. And turn the player off. And right here is a Panasonic multi-laser disc player. Um, What's really interesting about this one is I think it's some sort of industrial laser disc player. I mean you have your, your headphone jack and you have all your program buttons like normal, but you have a laser barcode insignia which means you can use it with some type of barcode scanner. And then you have your scan reverse forward, open close. On the back is where it gets really strange. Like back here you have your VHF connectors to treat this like a VCR and you have your standard video out, audio out, S video out and remote in over here but also this is the only laser display I've seen where the cables grounded so I'm not sure exactly why they would do that. It's also stamped for commercial use only so I'm guessing it's some sort of strange industrial player but I haven't really figured it out yet now over here it's one of my broken ones this is a Samsung LaserDisc video, video -orc. I'm not sure how you say it. But um, what's weird about this one is it seems to be like a combination karaoke machine. Because you have microphone inputs up here. I couldn't think of anything else that would be for. You have your digital echo, hi-fi, MPX, once more. Is that some sort of like replay or something? I'm not sure. And then... Up on the right, you got all your basic stuff, your numbers, open, close, skip, search, stuff like that. And on the back here, it's pretty basic with your video out, your audio out, and then uh, DC output, audio out, video out for a VHF adapter. So even though this has karaoke, at least I assume it's karaoke, it's kind of weird that they didn't put any sort of digital audio out on this. Now, the last player I'm going to show, this was my first Laserdisc player, which ended up breaking because it won't turn on anymore. I think it's from a power surge or something. But um, this one has your main tray and a CD tray, similar to the one with the DVD function I was showing earlier. The power button, quick turn display off, and then uh, over here you can control the CD part ejecting by itself, the laser disc, 
and then side A and B because this is a both side play model. Then you have your rewind, your fast forward, play pause, stop. And on the back you have some interesting options here. You have your AC3 out, two video outs, mono audio out, standard composite audio out, um, optical digital out, and then control in and out. I thought it's kind of weird that they put like all this digital audio stuff going on, but they didn't have any S video out, so this isn't really necessarily like a high-end video kind of thing. It's they focus more on audio with this one. But I guess that they made a bunch of different models and let like, consumers try to figure it out. And uh hope you guys enjoyed this segment and hope you learned something and uh see you later. Hope you guys liked that segment. It's a lot longer than the ones I've normally done, but I hope it didn't bore everybody too much. Um so now I want to talk a little bit about donations. I recently put up a PayPal donation button on my site. And um, that's just for people who want to throw a couple bucks in. It's, you know, I'm by no means, like, trying to go out and get donations from people. Um, but, you know, there's some people out there that are just like, hey, I like this show, how can I help? You know, and they might want to send some money my way, that's cool. Um, all that money would probably be used for stuff on eBay so that I can get some hardware for certain segments or maybe DV tapes since this is my last one there's only four minutes left on it so I'm also thinking about doing hardware donations so if you have some cool piece of old tech you can send it my way I'll do it in my show um, segment donations I'm thinking more about that if I know you well enough you know and if the content fits in with the show then I'll definitely take a donated segment and um, even segment ideas, because sometimes I show some stuff in the background that I don't really cover it that well, and people might be wondering, you know, what it is. So with that out of the way, I'm going to introduce our last segment by Pat, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, I'm Pat. Today I'm going to show you how to dial, dial into a BBS using this 1996 Hayes serial modem. Okay, so first when you open your Hyper Terminal on Windows XP, you notice you won't be able to type anything. So you gotta turn on your serial modem. Then you'll be able to type stuff like this. It's just garbage, just ignore this. So our first command is the AT command. Now the AT command will get the attention of the modem. Now the DT, which is added onto the AT, uh, represents the DTMF or dual tone multi-frequency. This will tell, this will generate tones over the phone line instead of using the old pulse dialing system. Now I'm going to select a BBS I got off of the internet. I'll give you a link down below. Now all you have to do after this, after we enter the 10 digit phone number, is we have to hit enter. And we wait a little bit. Now the first thing that should pop up is the carrier. This is the uh, baud rate of the modem that you're connecting to. I'm going to get select one for ANSI. Yes, I have a color display because Hyper Terminal supports color. And it should display the ASCII art. Now all you have to do from here is you can type in new if you don't have an account before or you can type in your existing username and password if you haven't already joined. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked that segment by Pat. I've actually known Pat for a little while now through the IRC channel. And um, he's a pretty cool guy. And he's actually trying to do his own show, but he's run into some pitfalls and 
you know, he hasn't been able to produce much, so I thought that it would be cool to get him to do a segment for Obsolete. And I think it turned out pretty well. And um, that about leads us to the end of the episode. I'd like to do some shout-outs to uh, Electronic Beer, which is a podcast done by Cheese and Cloud Chaos and Dark Sene and Moonlit. And um, they keep talking about me on the show, but I haven't really gotten around to returning the favor yet, so this is my time to do that right now. Definitely advise that you guys should check that out. Uh, also like to say thanks to uh, Binary Revolution Forums and the uh, Rant Media Forums. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people on those sites, and I'm trying to cater to what people say works and what doesn't work. And um, as always, you can email me with your questions and comments and you know proposals if you want to do a show segment or something like that, or basically anything. If your mind's you know twisting around the show in any sort of fashion, you can always hit me up. And I always get back to you as soon as I can, usually within a day. So that's it for episode four of Obsolete. Hope you guys like it, and I'll see you again soon. Ginger from American Ecstasy. When you see a scrambled picture on this channel, don't worry. We'll be testing the uncensored American Triple Ecstasy every night at 10 p.m. Eastern. It's so hot, we have to scramble. You can descramble the channel with the American Triple Ecstasy Descrambler box. $399 includes everything you'll need for the first year. The second year is only $120, guaranteed. Order now by calling 1-212-696-4111 during the day with MasterCard or Visa. Or send check or money order to American Ecstasy, P.O. Box 1948, New York, New York, 10156. Members of American Ecstasy can use their 20% discount and pay only $319. These are the original versions, no editing. When we start officially, that's when your first year begins. You will not be billed for the Triple X testing period. If you've already ordered, you'll be getting this box very soon. Throw away the big tools and follow these simple directions. It hooks up like a VCR. Audio and video out of your satellite receiver into the box. Out of the box into your TV set. Plug the box into the wall. That's it. You'll see the hottest television in America. American Triple Ecstasy plans to bring you New Wave Hookers, Sex Drive, Smoker, Bordello, Sex Crimes 2084, and over 100 others. Send $399 to American Triple Ecstasy, P.O. Box 1948, New York, New York, 10156, or call 1212. 6964111 weekdays from 9 to 5 American Triple Ecstasy we excite you